And I've been doing that a little bit on Wednesday night. And I love the history of hymns. I, I've always loved to sing, even when I was a child. We would go on trips and they would just sing. Because then we had AM radio. If you never just had AM radio, well, you'd understand. But uh, we would sing all our old favorites. And my Aunt Audra's favorite was, I come to the garden alone. She could not sing. But she tried. And it was a lot of fun. And my grandmother's favorite song was the old rugged cross. And uh, my sister was dying. We sang, we sang, Great is thy faithfulness. She loved that song, that God was faithful. Never sing Paradise Valley, don't think of Mighty Faith sitting right there. Never sing a uh, oh, beautiful star Bethlehem that I don't see Dink smiling back there because that's her favorite song. Oh, beautiful star Bethlehem shining afar through shadows dim. You know, brethren, we don't think about it much, but we're commanded to sing. Paul said to teach and admonish one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing with one another from the heart, making melody with the heart unto the Lord. You know, God didn't say we all had to be great singers. Didn't say we all had to be able to carry a tune. But he commanded us all to sing and make melody in our heart unto him. And through my life, that's been something that I've cherished. Shannon and the kids, Susie, we would sing going down the road. And I remember Jay's kids uh, being in the back seat, driving back from Colorado. And it amazed me, they liked them old hymns. Old hymns. Me and Susie, my kids will be driving. They'll be like, let's sing this old him and me and Susie will kind of roll our eyes like, man, we just wore ourselves out on that, you know. But they love them old hymns. Dan and I come back to Eureka Springs one time. The church band, Eileen, was alive then. Several of them that are here, and we were all driving back. And Shannon and I got singing, and we finally got into Oklahoma. And, and Eileen says, you and Shannon have been singing for two and a half hours straight. And, uh, and you know, that was, a, that was a great time. Great, great memories. Songs do more than should do more than sound good. They should talk to us. That's our opportunity to get to speak to each other. You know, we have a little songwriting history in this congregation. I don't know if you knew that or not, but but our own little Tara Crumb down here, her uh, grandfather, her grandfather, uh, Vep Ellis, Vespu, right? Vespu Ellis. He uh, was a songwriter, and if you've ever sang uh, Do You Know My Jesus, number 940, in our book, he wrote that song. Uh, and when we was at Dollywood uh, a couple, three years ago, and she's got a songwriter museum in there, and she's got a whole little section in there that's dedicated to uh, Vep Ellis. So uh, anytime you sing Do You Know My Jesus, and I got the opportunity one time to sing that with... Uh, Alyssa and, and uh, Vep, Tara's dad over here in the auditorium. That was kind of neat to get to sing that song with the people, uh, ancestors of the guy who had, who had written that song. And I love that song. Do you know my Jesus, right? Have you a heart that's weary, burdened with a load of care, right? Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have you heard he loves you and that he will abide to the end? What a wonderful song. Those songs all mean... A lot to me. There was a guy by the name of Cleland McAfee. I don't have a monitor this morning, so I'm kind of going to be looking back a lot. He was a Presbyterian minister in Parkville, Missouri, 1903. Diphtheria. You know, that's something we don't think much about today, do we? We talk about vaccines, but what the wonder, the wonder of a vaccine. Diphtheria was a terrible disease. Killed whole families children especially many is one case killed 12 children in one family we don't hear about that disease anymore that's wonderful but in 1903 the brother of cleveland had two young daughters that both died of diphtheria within 24 hours they couldn't go to the house because it was quarantined and those in the house couldn't come out and cleveland according to his daughter he stayed awake all night one night wondering how he could minister to this family because it was the days before telephone, right? You couldn't just call them up. You couldn't send them a text or a Facebook. And he stayed awake all night. He wondered how 
can I minister to my brother? And he sat down and he wrote a song. Because they could stand outside that house and they could sing that song to that family who had just lost two precious little girls within the space of 24 hours to a terrible disease. And as he wrote this song, he wanted to tell his family and his brother, as we all should know at times of grief and sorrow, that the Lord is near to us. That the Lord is always near to those who call upon Him. To all who call upon Him in truth, the psalmist says. James says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so he sat down and he wrote a song, Near to the Heart of God. And in that song, he uses that phrase, if you sing through this whole song, I believe nine times within this song, he sings this. And so on a dark night, he stays all night, he writes this song, and the next morning he teaches it to the choir at the Presbyterian Church where he is. And that evening, about dark, they go to his brother's house where these two young children had died, and they sat outside this dark house with the grieving parents inside of it and under the darkened sky and in front of a darkened house they minister to them in the only way that they know they can they minister to them in song and what a beautiful song so if we sing this song this morning we might think a little bit about that circumstance and about how song can be a ministry to those who are hurting and to those in pain how many times when i'm in pain or sorrow my mind drifts back to a song to the words that I've heard over in my life. Songs that mean so much to me. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sin from the heart of God. Hold us to wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. There is a place of Comfort sweet near to the heart of God, a place where we our Savior meet near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless I think about that song I think over a hundred years ago in front of a grieving house they ministered to a family with the words of a song and how powerful that song still is today to know that we're near near to the heart of God even in our sorrow and our pain God never leaves us God never forsakes us you know there's another guy that has a story that seems too tragic to be true and his name's Joseph Joseph Scriven 
Probably never, never heard of this guy. He was from Ireland, and he was going to be married. So he goes to, the, takes his horse. This is a long time ago. So he takes his horse, and he goes to the river to meet his wife. He's going to marry on the next day. And her horse throws her into the river, and she hits her head, and she dies, drowns in the river. And so Joseph, he, of course, is heartbroken, and he's having religious issues anyway with the church that they're in in Ireland. So Joseph goes to Canada, goes to Port Hope, Canada. And Joseph is a teacher and pretty educated individual. He comes from a fairly influential family. And eventually Joseph goes to work for a uh, naval, retired naval officer's family as a, as a tutor. And he falls in love with Elijah, Eliza, Eliza. Falls in love with Eliza, and he and the, the, the guy's niece, and soon to be married to Eliza. And shortly before the wedding, Eliza becomes ill with pneumonia and passes away. So Joseph will never marry. And Joseph makes it his ambition to live the Sermon on the Mount. And Joseph goes throughout Canada with his tools and his saw. And he goes to widows' houses and people who can't afford it, and he, and he, he cuts their wood, and he fixes their houses, and he's quite the poet. He does quite a few different, different uh, poetry throughout his life. One time a man sees Joseph walking, he says, that's an industrious man. He says, I would love to hire him to work for me. And the guy with him says, well, unless you can't afford him, he won't work for you. Joseph had the heart of a servant. And Joseph's mother was ill. It was 1855. Joseph's mother was ill in Ireland. And Joseph sat down and wrote a poem to send to his mother. And the words of the poem went something like this. They went something like... Lost my note. They went something to the effect of what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what grief we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And Joseph sent that poem to his mother in Ireland. And his mother somehow came into the hands of a composer who set it to music. And because of that, and it was years, actually about 20 years, after that had happened, that it actually came back that he had actually originally written the poem. He had no idea that it had actually been turned into a song. And because this song was so close to Joseph, because he wrote it to his mother, he never included it in any of his other works. But this song has become treasured and beloved, and it all started because of this poem that he wrote to his mother. James 5 says, Is anyone among you suffering? He must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. You know, we sing this song a lot, don't we? What a friend we have in Jesus. But we don't always do what this song says. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. You know, Joseph was a man who had so much sorrow in his life. It seems like everything went against him. But yet he had his Lord and he had his God. And even in times of trial, he understood that that was his place of refuge and peace was at the heart of God. What a beautiful song. What a friend we have in Jesus. I'm going to raise it. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Oh, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often for. 
forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? <clears throat> we should never courage. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come, but with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. And then if you really look hard, whoops, lost slide. At this song, there was actually a Church of Christ hymnal in Boston, Massachusetts, copyright 1866. And there was another verse to this song not included in our in our uh, in our hymn in our book uh, another verse that was written is included in that hymnal though satan should buffet though trials should come let this blessed assurance control that christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul boy you know that's a guy that when I, every time i sing that song i can't help but think of the misery in his life and, and the things that he went through. And to have your wife die the day before your wedding. Can you just imagine that? To die in front of you the day before your wedding. And yet this man writes this powerful, powerful song. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee. That always gives me chills when I sing that verse of that song. Do thy friends despise forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Thou wilt find a solace there. What powerful words in a song. But as best sorrowful as his story is, <laughs> a lot of sorrowful stories this morning, because hymns are born out of grief a lot of times, out of pain and suffering, and people express themselves through these words and through these songs. And as bad as Joseph's life was, he had nothing on Horatio and Anna Spafford. You know, Horatio... Spafford was a wealthy man, a lawyer, wealthy man in Chicago, became very much involved with D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a big evangelist. Chicago fire just almost wiped him out. Had a son. Son died of scarlet fever at two years old. Decided he would go overseas, going to join up with D.L. Moody in Europe. Spend a little time in evangelism, which is pretty impressive considering the guy just lost most everything, right? In the Chicago fire. But he was held up trying to take care of loose ends, take care of property, take care of things that he had. He's a fairly wealthy individual. Trying to clear that stuff up. And so he sent Anna and the girls ahead on the faded Vildiar freighter. And it was struck by another ship. Sank in 12 minutes. 200 souls lost their lives. A fisherman in a rowboat found a woman clinging to a piece of floatsome in the water and pulled her from the water, and it was Anna Spafford. In the days before, tele before telephones, you had to send telegraphs. 
to Anna Spafford sends one of the most famous telegraphs in Christian hymnal history. She sent a telegraph to him that says, all is lost. I got it for you. Saved alone. What shall I do? All four of his daughters drowned. Horatio Spafford sits down. There's conflicting reports of exactly if he did it in Chicago in a place that he ate or whether he did it when he followed them shortly thereafter in a ship and came to the place and the captain said, this is the place where the ship sank, the build of your sank, and this is where your daughters perished. But either way, Horatio on a napkin wrote down some words that we sing, we've often sung, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, God has taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Isaiah 66, 12 says, For thus says the Lord, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream, and you will be nursed, and you will be carried on the hip and fondled on the knees. You know, he did something that was, that was uh, hard to understand, didn't he? He was able to find peace and find God in the time of tremendous sorrow. He was able to write that down and pin it and to make it what it should be. I think this song, even before I knew what it meant, it always meant a lot to me. It always kind of spoke to me. I always thought about the 23rd Psalms, about David. And where David said, The Lord leadeth me beside still waters. Thy rod and thy staff, thy comfort me. The idea of the comfort of Christ and going beside a peaceful river in a time of trial. You know, one thing studying these hymns and studying people that wrote them teaches me is that grief, we don't have a monopoly on grief, do we? We don't have a monopoly on sorrow. Sorrow exists in the world and will always exist in the world until Jesus comes again. But how do we deal with it? How do we express ourselves in times of sorrow, in times of pain? And so we sing this song, It is well with my soul. What a great song. In peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrow like sea Billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well, it is well with my soul, my sin, all oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. shall be sight my sin zero 
scroll back as a scroll. The Lord shall descend, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. You know, if you look at that song in your book, number 490, if you look at that song in your hymnal, you'll notice something. The guy's name. And the guy's name is Philip Paul Bliss. Generally, you'll see it as P.P. Bliss. And Philip Paul Bliss was a gentleman that started as a teacher, was involved in music, taught himself to compose, had a really great baritone voice, I understand. He, uh, D.L. Moody heard him. And D.L. Moody said, Philip, he says you need to go into music evangelism. So Philip decided that's what he would do. And he got hooked with a guy, um, D.W. Whittle. D.W. Whittle. He was an evangelist, D.W. Whittle. And he got going with him, went with him about two years. It was Christmas time, 1876. Philip Bliss and his wife went to stay with her mother for Christmas, soon to leave thereafter to go back on the trail, on the evangelistic trail with D.W. So they left and they got him and they left their daughters with her mother and they got on a train to go to Pennsylvania, to go to, was going to New York or Pennsylvania, but they got on a train to go to meet up with this evangelist to do these meetings. And they went to Ashtabula, Ohio. And, on, and in 1876, December 29th, shortly after Christmas, that train fell into the river and caught on fire. Philip was spared, but his wife was in the burning wreckage. Philip, desperately wanting to save his wife, runs into the, into the canyon that the train went into. It's winter, covered in snow, trains on fire, burning up. Philip runs back in to try to save his wife. In his attempt to save his wife, Philip also is burned to death. And if you look at the song, It Is Well For My Soul, it's Philip Bliss, P.P. Bliss, who wrote the music for that song, It Is Well With My Soul. But P.P. Bliss wrote so many songs that we, that we know. More than this, this is just in our book. Philip Bliss was prolific. He was a prolific songwriter and a prolific recorder. And all these songs that you see, Hallelujah, what a Savior, I gave my life for thee. It is well with my soul. Once for all, I will sing of my Redeemer. Wonderful worlds of life. One of my daughter's favorite songs, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. There's a great story behind that song. Let the lower lights be burning. More holiness give thee. I bring my sins to thee. That's one of my favorite songs. I bring my sins to thee. The sins I cannot count. Right? What an amazing song. Whoever he whosoever heareth in a song, not in our book, but I had to put it on this list because it's the most second, most used invitational song of all time. Almost persuaded. Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded. Christ to receive. Remember that song comes right out of the book of Acts. And in the wreckage, in the burning wreckage of this train is P.P. Bliss's trunk, Philip's trunk. And in Philip's trunk, there's a song that he had just written the words to. No music. He'd just written the words. And that song was taken out of that trunk. And the composer put the words to it. 
to this song. And it's become a cherished hymn, a cherished song. 513 in your book. I will sing of my Redeemer. You know, I hope you get something out of this this morning. I hope you get, you get out of this is that God commanded us to sing. You know, we forget that, don't we? He commanded us to do it. He didn't say it was optional. He didn't say we should do it if we feel like it. He said we're to sing and encourage one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. You know, he is with everything in our worship, whether it's taking communion, whether it's praying, whether it's teaching, whether it's singing, he gave us things that we can all be involved in, didn't he? All be involved in. If God would have told us to all play a piano, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Or you'd be in a lot of trouble. But I can't play a piano. I'll probably play a trumpet a little bit. That might not go so well. But he gave us something we all have, right? He gave us our heart to make melody in and our voice to express our praises to him. And so as we close this, this sermon, I know this hasn't been a lot of a sermon, and Jay's going to offer an invitation, and you're certainly welcome to respond to that, and we'd encourage you to do that if you have any need. I know this isn't a heavy sermon. I was so looked forward to doing this. I was laying in bed, I don't know, Tuesday or Wednesday night, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, you know how you do. And uh, I was sitting there, and I was thinking of these songs, and they were going over my head, and I was thinking about these guys who wrote them. And I... And I just thought, man, I just want to share this with you, you know, because it's just, it's an encouragement to me when I sing these songs and I know the stories behind them and I know what these people went through and I know that they didn't lose their faith and I know it's, it's great for me. And, you know, I hope, and I, and I think this morning you're either going to love this sermon or you're going to hate it. You know, I don't think there's going to be much middle ground, but I hope that you love it. And I hope that when you open up a hymn, because hymns are going away. I mean, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. The day of the hymn book, it's fading fast. It really is, more than you know. I've got a, got a friend of mine that does, sings, the, Donnie Williamson, they go around and sing congregations. He actually has the hymn books from the Church of Christ in Wetumpka when they close that church. He has them hymn books in his bus. And when he goes into churches all over the country to sing today, he carries them hymn books into those churches, and the children in those churches don't know. They'll go, what's that? What's a hymn book? I've never seen a hymn book. Because songs are on the back, and songs are praise songs. And you know, praise songs are great, and I love singing them. I, I really enjoy singing them. I love that song list Jay did. I love those songs. But some of these old hymns will always have a place in my heart that I just don't think can be replaced with about anything else. You know, because they just are part of who I am. And I know it's going away, and that's okay, because that's life. And there was a time in history that this was all brand new. And it, it's not going to be, and now it's getting old. But in my heart, they held a really special place. And I hope this morning that you, when you sing these songs, you don't just sing it. You think about what you're saying, and you think about those words, and you realize that you're talking to each other when you sing them. And what wonderful things they have to say. So we'll close with this song. Jay's going to offer an invitation. What a beautiful song. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me On the cruel cross He suffered Paid the debt and made me free Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me, on the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story How my lost estate to save In His boundless love and mercy He the ransom freely gave Sing, oh sing 
of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon. Paid the debt and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God with him to be. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. You know, I often wonder when Philip was writing that song if he knew that that would be the last song he would ever write. And I thought, how fitting to say, sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer and his wonderful love for me. How on the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. If we can do anything for you this morning, won't you let it be known while we stand.